I hang it over a very clean floor. Uh, again, virgin, for those of you who don't know, is uh, it's right between Buffalo and Rochester. It's in western New York or rural New York. Um, we've been there since the uh, 1960s. And really quickly wanted to go over Liberty Pumps, obviously. Uh, you guys know this because you carry our full line of pumps, but when I say our full line of pumps, all we deal with is dirty water, right? We're in, we are trying to do basically four categories that we are specialized in. Just dewatering, moving water away from the building that you don't want there, which is basically drain pumps or sump pumps. Effluent pumps, again, moving stuff away from the building, but effluent's kind of sludgy, greasy, uh, gray water, we'll call it, okay? Sewage, that'll actually handle solids. So now we're moving up the, the food chain and what dirty jobs these pumps do. And finally, our grinder pumps. So those really are the four basic categories that we specialize in. Um, there's other specialty categories or some of the things I'll call subcategories, meaning, you know, there's explosion proof versions of some of those pumps, right? For example, there's some high heat or high head versions of these pumps. Um, and then there's things that I'll call like just outside of that and not necessarily doing what we call dewatering, like a transfer pump. Right, transferring water from one place to another. Uh, condensate pumps, again, kind of it's kind of a, a way of dewatering. You're moving that condensate that you don't need, but I'll just call those specialty categories. And then of course, engineered systems, prepackaged things that come with panels, alarms, all those kind of things. So uh, extra categories other than looking at the four main categories of pumps, just to make sure that we're clear on what Liberty does. We often get questions, do you do well pumps? Do you do pool pumps, booster pumps? No, anything that does clean water that you would want to be involved with, no, we do wastewater. And as I mentioned, Western New York, that's where we're located. Has anybody ever from here been back to our factory? Yeah, I've been back. Okay, very cool. And we're, we're back to uh, factory tours. So if you guys have people, especially at the counter, that you really, that, that are focused on pumps and you want them to go back to the factory, it's, it's a three day excursion. Pretty much. One day is just yeah. lost in travel coming from the West, obviously, getting to Rochester. There's you know, direct flights out of anywhere in the West. So we burn one day. Of, you're lucky if you can get there by the dinner hour if you leave here at 6 a.m. Uh, and then the next day, we actually try to do some training in the factory with the plant tour. And then, as Jason mentioned, we can get out and do something, uh, you know, trip to Niagara Falls isn't too far away from there, some things like that. Maybe a, a Bills game, if anybody's a Buffalo Bills fan. Probably not here, but that's something. We, we can do something to entertain you for a day before we send you back home. Um, and we plan on doing that someday soon, so we'll try to get a group together and do that. So are they still, are they doing engineer products in the same facility? Yeah, they sure are. Is it, which one is this one? Uh, yeah, 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 we are. And again, we've been in, we've been in Virgin, uh, since the sixties, as we mentioned, and, uh, it's our third location we've had there. It's now one that we can keep growing. In fact, we are growing up in addition to, uh, I think it's at something about 250,000 square feet of factory floor space. We're adding another 105,000 square feet that's under construction right now. Uh, anything in the great supply chain debacle of 2021 and 2022 has taught us anything is you got a little more inventory, not just stuff that's finished goods, but components that you make product with. Anybody who thought just in time inventory was a good idea to learn differently in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. So luckily you guys know we've been digging out of that. We're doing a great job uh, compared to where we were about a year ago on our shipping and lead times. I think y'all get the memos telling you what each category of pump and what the expected lead times are from order date right now. Um, you've got a couple things that are still two or three weeks out, but that's a hell of a lot better than where we were where some things were 13 or 14 weeks out. And uh, again, I think the idea of adding a little warehousing space is to keep inventory around so that when we get spikes in demand, we can fulfill and, and uh, build faster. So yeah, if you were to come out there right now, you would see that photograph and then another, like I mentioned, another 100,000 square feet being built on. We have enough property now and enough land to keep growing into what we've become, which is a little bit bigger company than, than we've been in the past. Um, and speaking of the past, that little picture, that, that's our first drain pump. I know you guys know the, the newest one we have is the 406. We joke about that being the Montana pump because of the area code of 406, but that's the compact version of the 404. This is the 400 way back in the day. In 1968, I'm, I'm going to guess that's uh, it looks like aluminum. There's one of those in the, you know, uh, our showroom back in New York that you can see on display along with some other retired products and the current lineup. But that's that's kind of a museum piece now. But that's one of our things that we do. And that's uh, if you think about the pump packages that we'll get into later, even starting with the small little drain pumps is one of those categories we've done really well on since the beginning. 
Uh, one thing that I'd like to make sure that I point out to our customers, especially our plumbing contractors, about that three-year warranty is that anything in that whole catalog that Jason gave you, anything that's a pump, if it's a pump, whether it's a drain pump, a sewage pump, a grinder pump, it has a three-year warranty. Um, it's unique to us. You know, uh, one of our bigger competitors is uh, Zoller, who you can actually walk down the retail. By the way, we also don't do any retail. We don't do anything with any big box, no Home Depot, no Lowe's. But Lowe's has partnered with Zoller, and they've got these big green bays that say Zoller pumps. And we just did this the other day. We walked through a store and take some photographs. They got things that are imported, things that are domestic, things that say professional contractor grade, but you can only buy them in retail. They don't sell them to the rest of them. And then they got those stuff that you can buy at the wholesale trade. But some of it says it's imported, as I mentioned. Some of it has two-year warranty. Some of it has three-year warranty. Some has a one-year warranty. It's confusing. So we've decided everything in our book has a three-year warranty. Any pump we make, whether it's one of our imported little condensate pumps, or some of our domestic made grinder pumps, anything that Liberty makes will give it a three-year warranty. The other thing that's really unique to us as a pump, or I'd say even in the plumbing business at all, is we don't prorate that three-year warranty. Contractor goes out and has a warranty call. It turns out we have deemed it a defect that it gets replaced. Even if that pump's two and a half years old, most manufacturers will give you a six-month warranty because that's what's left prorated on what you buy. We figure it's a brand new pump, it gets a brand new warranty. So the contractors love the fact that they know when they go out and put a new pump in the hole, it warranty gets reset. And it is from the date of the install, not the date it was manufactured. So uh, again, I think we're pretty unique in how we treat our customers with warranty service. Fortunately, we don't have very many warranty claims, which is why we can do that so easily. In fact, I believe less than 1% of what we actually move out of the factory ever comes back. And I'm not even counting that as defective because you know how that goes, right? Half of the warranty returns turns out there's no problem found. Pebble falls out of the impeller and you realize it was just jammed up. It was wired wrong. That's not really a warranty problem. Factoring all of that in, we still have less than 1% of what we sell come back. So you probably are aware that we also do scrap and field for warranty returns. That's, that's new since I started about a year ago. That if you ever have a warranty claim, the funny thing is that last time I gave this speech to a distributor, they said, we don't know, we haven't had a warranty claim in a year since you've been here, which is great. But we used to ask you to box them and send them back with your RGA number. We do the same thing. You get an RGA credit number. So you get your credit memo for the return pump. But we're going to ask you most times to really toss that pump without some special exception. There's some things that might be so weird that we really would ask to ship it back and we'll help you handle that so we can look at it. Um, but in general, scrap it and move on. And I've got a form that I'll share and have been sharing with all the branches that is real self-explanatory. It's a two sheet form. I think the first one tells you what to do. The second one is what you fill out. So it's very, very easy to work with now. There's no, not a, like Joe said, if we want it back, we'll tell you we want it back. But typically it's just scrapping the field and a, a credits issue. So, yep. so um, I'll just get into a couple categories of things that we make and kind of move through the product line, if you will. But I think we've covered enough about the history, location, obviously what makes us different with warranty. Also, our technical service team. Uh, the one last thing I'll, I'll cover again about us doing a great job, I think, with customer service. Everything from our local reps being engaged to other than the fact that we're on East Coast time and this is mountain time zone. Mm -hmm. uh, so you got to factor the two hour time differential, but we don't do a rapid phone tree. When you call us our 800 number, a live person will answer that phone as long as we're open for business. Uh, and that live person will transfer you wherever you need to go. When it's tech service, usually there's one of 10 or 12 guys working on that phone that, that love talking to customers. Once again, I say that because when I say customers, being that we're not a big box retail, we're never getting, you know, Billy homeowner that wants to figure out how to fix his own pump. We have a pretty big advantage that, uh, most of our pump. First off, they're usually in a pit covered with something real dirty and a, and a homeowner doesn't want to mess with that at all. And usually who we're talking to is either an engineer, a contractor, a distributor, somebody in the business. So we have a, a great time and we actually enjoy talking to our customers and helping solve problems. Um, okay, so as I mentioned, we got four categories of pumps and kind of on the outside outliers. I'll start with some really small stuff. I like to also start with the very few exceptions. As you know, I told you about 90% of what's in that catalog there is domestically made in New York. I'm going to start with the exception, smaller, little imported products because of small motors, small parts, condensate pumps. I know you guys have a different line of condensate pumps, but just to let you know, we do make a complete family of condensate pumps, everything from that low profile to a mini split version that you're seeing here. And our latest is a neutralizing for like condensed fuel vapor coming out of condensing furnaces, condensing tankless or boilers. Uh, that has an easy filter chain. The biggest advantage I think of having Liberty pumps, if you do ever move to us for condensate is uh, people use it to make their freight minimum to be really honest with you 
you know, I got a $3,000 minimum to make freight. They got a $2,750 order. Like, yeah, I'll throw a couple of condensate pumps on and we're done. We made freight. So that's, there is an advantage to doing that if you ever decide to go that way. But that is our line of condensate pumps. As I mentioned, we have the whole gamut from low profile to plenum rated to mini split to a neutralizing version. Moving into some other small pumps that are also out of our imported series that we just call small utility pumps. You can tell by that kind of tan plastic housing. You guys do sell a lot of these. But these are kind of the uh, entry level, if you will. Um, you, you know, uh, and these we would also call them maybe contractor grade or new construction grade to be in that new housing market. You got to be competitive, and almost everybody has some kind of small uh, imported series. Don't don't be fooled. That even though they're import with small motors, they work really well. These are great quality pumps. Is everybody familiar with that piggyback style plug operation, and why we call that a piggyback plug? Kind of like how the plugs. Uh, now, almost every pump, including these little guys here, have that type of uh, arrangement where the float switch plugs into the power outlet, the pump then plugs into the piggybacks right into that. And one of the reasons for that is when a contractor goes out to diagnose a pump that's not working, gets a service call, very first thing you do is unplug both of those, separate them, take the pump cord and plug it directly into the outlet. If that pump starts moving, you know immediately you don't have a pump problem, you got a bad flow. Because then floats wind up getting replaced, or they get caught up something, they're stuck on something, or they're just they're just old, and then their service life you can put a new float in and replace it. But one of the reasons we do almost everything in that piggyback piggyback style float system is that you get one outlet to plug everything into, then you can separate them later when you're diagnosing and troubleshooting. Make sense? Drain pumps that I mentioned again. This is again small stuff, but these are now domestically made products. Starting with our, uh, like I said, the 406 is the latest one. That's that one in the middle. Um, the other ones you're familiar with, you sell a lot of the 404s and have for a long time, and that's probably the most popular drain pump kit on the market. Uh, there are other um, competing models that you guys don't sell, thankfully. We appreciate that. But one of the things that's different, you can tell your customers, if that thing comes built and ready to go, you plug it in, you plumb it, and you work. Uh, I compare some of our competitors to IKEA stuff. They got imported stuff and parts and thread seal tape and gasket material and a bunch of screws and nuts and washers in a bag and you really have to look at those instructions and figure out how to build it, you're talking about 30 to 45 minutes worth of assembly time before you can even get out of the sink and put that thing where it goes. Ours, you take it out of the box, it's ready to go. Uh, as I mentioned, this one's been around for a long time and aside from just having a bigger base and it does have a bigger pump, so even though this is convenient and it was made to fit into a vanity or something like underneath the lab sink, uh, it's also convenient because it has those lower, what we call ground level inlets. So if somebody's doing a half bath or a bath and adding a shower, a shower pan would have to be built up pretty high to drain into the top of that bigger pump, right? So that smaller one has got its place. It's smaller, smaller motor, smaller, more compact, low inlets. But the only thing it won't do is solids bigger than one eighth inch, which is about the size of a lemon seed. So if somebody's ever going to use it for like an outdoor kitchen, uh, a bar sink, a wet bar, and they're going to put a garbage disposal, I would move right into this one. Because one, again, it's going to load from the top, and that'll handle three eighths inch solids because it's got a little bigger motor in it. The 406 too, just so you all know, and you probably do, and I don't know how much you get involved with the um, gain share program with iMark on the, the counter level. Do you guys know much about that? But the 406 is a huge uh, piece of the iMark gain share this year. You guys have probably blown it out of the water with uh, some previous orders. But we just like to point it out because it is something that is being paid attention to. We're going to talk about that later on today in our meeting, but it is something that we're trying to push a lot of until the end of the year. So basically, there's there's a, a kind of an incentive at the end of the year for each one of those you guys sell as part of my mark. And that was one of the two product lines. The other one's not probably worth mentioning because you don't do a lot of them, but small drain pumps, you've always done a lot, mostly in that 404. We came out last summer and introduced that 406, and in January we announced an IMARC incentive for the end of the year. And it also helps that it's called the 406, I think, up here. I think people like it, think we would maybe design it for the state of Montana, which uh, based on sales right now, you would think we did too, because you guys are killing it, which is great. Um, and then the 405, which again, other than a larger base and slightly larger pump, it's a high head pump. And the yellow, anytime you see yellow cord coming up, that also uh, indicates high heat. So where we see that, at least where I see it most commonly here in the West is uh, Circle K, 7-Eleven, a lot of these convenience store, truck stop, gas station, whatever, a lot of them wanted to put that kind of that high-end coffee bar island in the middle where you can go make your own coffee or press the cappuccino button or serve yourself something. 
uh, there's a little drain in the middle where they're pouring hot coffee down there. And often that island was built where there was no floor drain. So it's actually going into one of those high heat pumps, moving someplace else to where there is a gravity fed floor drain somewhere else in the building. Um, so often you can open up and you can see the bags are off the ground the pumps underneath that cabinet. Um, and that's just one example of where I see a lot of that being used. Uh, and really, I guess the other way to think of it is kind of more the commercial version of that 404 because of the high volume, the high head and high heat. Capacity. And that yellow is consistent throughout for high heat. Yep. So if anything that you see yellow is going to run through the whole product line. What a great segue into that, right? Because that is a what I call it a water heater track. Again, sorry about going back into the water heater world, but I used to see just about every commercial water heater truck had some kind of transfer pump on the back. Once again, the high heat cord is letting you know that's a high heat capacity pump. And the reason I wanted to put this one in here is I think it gets overlooked quite a bit. A lot of folks make transfer pumps. Um, they're not all the same. In fact, uh, well, I might as well just bring one up. Milwaukee has got a red one with a handle that looks very similar, but there's no cord on it because it's got a battery pack. And we have a lot of plumbers tell us, oh, I've got the Milwaukee version of it. And they wind up saying when they've tried this one, it's, it's significantly different in how much horsepower the pump having that AC motor. Uh, especially if anybody's doing uh, heat exchanger flushes with it, it's one of the things you can use it for. Some folks use it for doing solar thermal panels where they want to flush the solar panels on a roof. And I've been told that if you stand on the ground with a cordless pump, you don't have enough lift to get up to the roof. This one has it uh, in droves. As you can see, it's got 105 foot, 105 feet maximum head discharge. It's got, a, it's a workhorse of a pump. In fact, the only thing I've told plumbers that if you are draining from a hot water tank that's still got warm water in it, use PEX tubing or a reinforced hose because it has so much suction that it'll suck a garden hose flat and then obviously run it self-drive. That's how much power this thing has if you have to use something reinforced. Um, very easily serviceable. It shouldn't need to be, but we've had folks put it on the back of their truck after they do a heat exchanger flush or they do a water heater change out where it's now got water in the pump. They leave it on the back of their truck overnight and it freezes and the water in there expands. That can do a little damage, but for about 20 bucks, there's a rebuild kit. You see those four screws? Those pop off. You get a new seal, a new impeller, and that little screw cap in the back is for putting a new set of brush, uh, mo brushes on the motor. And then you've got, for about 20 bucks, rebuilt your bump completely. So now it's a new pump once again. That's a cast aluminum housing, so it looks really heavy like cast iron, but it's aluminum. It's pretty lightweight for what it does. Uh, that'll drain a 100-gallon commercial water heater in under 10 minutes. It'll do a 50-gallon heater in about five or six minutes, you know, residential heater. So uh, another advantage over a cordless version of this pump is if uh, a lot of hard water and sediment gets in there, one of the first things that a plumber is going to do is open the drain valve and try to drain that water out before removing the old water heater. That's what this, this comes into play, right? Well, if there's a lot of that hard water sediment that gets down and kind of sets above that drain valve, it's going to drain really slow. This one has enough suction that you can go in through the cold water side on the dip tube and just suck it out from the top, where a cordless one has a hard time getting that suction to get that thing drained from the top down. So once again, if you, somebody goes out and does a residential water heater change out, our joke used to be the technician has two choices. He can just open the valve, go out to the curb and smoke a cigarette, and check his emails on his phone, wait for it to drain in about 30 minutes. Or you can hook this thing up in five or six minutes, water's out, time is money, right? So this just speeds up water heater change outs. So uh, don't hesitate to ask any of your, I don't know if you see guys that are doing a lot of uh, R&R, you know, plumbing re uh, replacement water heater business, if they have a transfer pump, which one they're using, this one might be better than what, there's a, like I said, a lot of import ones, there's cordless ones. This is kind of the gold standard of the industry, if you will. Any other questions on that pump, by the way, or do we kind of kill it? <laughs> Beat it into the ground, dead, that horse is dead, move on. Okay, uh, the Ascent 2, um, again, something that's a unique to us because, not unique to us that we make a macerating toilet. There's other ones out there. The difference is ours is how well it works and how good it looks. This is the only one I've ever seen that actually doesn't look like it came out of a boat or an RV, which is kind of where macerating toilets came from. And the idea here is if somebody has a slab basement, a slab garage, they convert it into living space, and they don't want to bust up the concrete and put a drain in, this can actually move it through this macerating pump. It looks like a bunch of cutter blades, obviously. And uh, this pipe discharges out of the back, so you're bolting the toilet down to the floor like you would, but there's no drain flames down below. You're just bolting it down, and then it discharges out of the back into that macerating pump. There's additional inlets, so if somebody's building an entire bathroom, they can take the shower and the sink and also, as we're showing there, put it into that same pump. Nothing there really needs to be macerated, but, but it still evacuates and pumps out of there. And what's really cool about it is this one option for it is this extension. 
So when you can move that behind the wall and in installations where I've seen that, you can't see that pipe because of the tank and the bowl. You would actually have to crane your neck around to see it. So anybody walking in, that looks like a regular Vitreous China high-end toilet. It, like I mentioned, it doesn't look like it came out of somebody's motorhome. Um, it has an alarm built into it. It has a manual evacuation in case you're going on vacation, want to pump all that stuff out of that and let it, it would just clean water in it for a couple days. There's a lot of, uh, again, it, it comes in one big master pack so that a distributor knows that that one big skew is everything you need. The beam is slow, closed lid, the tank, the macerating pump. But if somebody doesn't want to load that in the back of their truck, they can open that master cart and now you have the regular tank is in one box, bowls in another box, that skinny lid with the toilet seat in it. Everything else can be unboxed from there. But the way it shows up to you is in one master cart where everything is in the box that you need. And uh, again, the only thing that you need to tell us is if you want a round bowl or elongated, Obviously, the elongated is the more popular, but uh, everything else you see, it's all about the same. And the only other option is whether or not they want that extension to put that tank behind the wall. And I get I kind of stating the obvious here, but I do get questions. This is a complete system. You can't buy somebody else's toilet and use it with our pumps, the, the ascent side of the, the, this system. It's got to be one unit. Number one and number two, we do have some lead time issues with it because of the China manufacturer who we're getting the toilet from. So a lot of times when people need this, they need it. So it's a good thing to look at from a stocking standpoint to have one on hand yeah. at each branch, just because it is kind of a, I need this and I need it now. And right now I think our lead time is a little bit higher on these, but just, just food for thought. So yeah, this is a unique item. So, and we are, uh, we're well in stock with them now, fortunately, so okay, good. Jason pointed out that's again, every, everything in this box is domestically made. That's not. So that's the hard part. Just like anybody else, we had container ships floating around with boxes of those things on there waiting to get unloaded a few months ago. But luckily, we've got a, uh, as I mentioned, we're expanding uh, inventory space in our factory now. We're, we're inventorying a lot of those right now. So we're in good shape. Uh, again, some of the things that we do, and I just cut this on this, we're showing here that these little 45 degree angle uh, discharge and inlet vent. It's one of the things we always think of neat little engine, like I showed you the uh, condensate pump, where we thought about how do you pull all the filter media off, and that's in one little basket for a quick change out. We like to think about things that make things either field convertible or really easy, or you don't have to carry extra SKUs. And in this particular case, our engineers looked at that 45 degree angle and took those pipes where you can rotate it. What that means is you can have a vertical discharge or a horizontal discharge simply by flipping that 180 degrees. You convert it right in the field so you don't have to carry an extra skew of one's vertical and one's horizontal. It's changeable right there, just boom, taking four screws out. Again, it's, it's the little things, right? That seems pretty simple. And I know I'm stating the obvious when you're looking at it, but I think it's one of the things where we are different. We take a look at things and think about it from customer service and the customer's point of view. Okay, kind of moving into one of the other categories we mentioned is just sump pumps. You guys know these pretty well, I think, with what we've got uh, in stock. Um, I, I think it's important though to point out that uh, we do sell a lot of both the cast iron and the aluminum. The aluminum, personally, I like. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why the aluminum housing is uh, it's lighter weight and more energy efficient because it happen to be more energy efficient because aluminum in the way it's coefficient of heat transfer, it actually is a better conductor. It stays cooler. Cooler motor runs a little more efficiently. And again, I'm, just, I'm kind of an old guy, right? So now that I'm out, you know, when I was younger, picking up cast iron pumps with my forearm was no problem. I think as soon as you get over, you know, half horsepower pumps, I'd much rather try to lift up the aluminum one on my own than cast iron. So uh, they're a little, again, they're at a premium, a little more pricey, but uh, again, they're basically internally the same as these. And that's when I mentioned, people ask, well, how can they be more energy efficient if it's the same motor? It just has to do with running cooler. So you'll often see some of those older posters and some of the branches here too that'll say that, you know, either a traditional cast iron or cool running aluminum. And that's what that's all about. And again, you guys sell an awful lot of uh, sump pumps for us in both, both series. Um, sewage pumps, you guys move a lot of those too. Uh, handles up to two inch solids with, you know, two inch inlet, two inch discharge is not a grinder. This is one of my favorite areas because people, um, a lot of contractors start just using the term grinder synonymously with sewage pump. And the way I always told uh, counter guys to solve that is when somebody goes, I need a grinder pump. I need a one horse grinder pump. I need two, great, bring them one, show them the invoice. When they flip out and go, that's about three times more than what you really meant was you wanted a sewage pump. They don't all grind, right? So this is made to actually take 
solids, right? Uh, which we say usually in a sewage pit, we're hoping that's all in there is human waste, toilet paper, and that's it. But that's what that inlet, those impellers are made to pass that stuff through. What goes in two inches in diameter comes out two inches in diameter. Or a grinder pump, we'll talk about that in a little bit, obviously chops things up into a small little slurry before it goes in. Uh, is there any questions? Do you guys have anything on sewage pumps in general you wanted to ask about? Um, one of the things we're showing here is obviously the different switch availability, right? There's a wide angle float. There's a vertical float that maybe somebody has a small, narrow basin. They don't have the room for that traditional float to swing up. That's why we do in a vertical float option. It's important, I think, to let you guys know also, if we ever are in a back order situation, which again, ho hopefully we're going to stay in good shape now for the rest of this year at least. But that has been one of those things too, where somebody needs something today. It might be okay that we have something with a vertical switch or a wide angle switch as an option. Um, often, if they can't put in a wide angle switch, they can't. Uh, but if they have enough room, they can put in either one. And there's really not much or, or any cost difference with either type of switch. So sometimes it's easier to get whatever is available and apply that. Okay, other uh, sewage pumps in the series. Uh, the omnivore, omnivore grinder, again, this is one of our claims to fame. We are not the first folks to ever come out with a grinder pump. Uh, we are the first ones to have one that works as well as this does. And again, we talked about the warranty. You guys move a lot of these. That has to do with that, that V-slice cutting technology. We've talked about that hardened stainless blade. You guys have probably seen it. So we were here last summer with that trailer. I don't know how often we, we get out here to do that, but I was here a year ago. We were filling up the trough and grinding up shop rags and denim jeans and leather work gloves. There's just about... There's not much you can throw at this pump that it won't chew up. But if it can't chew it up, that blade just knocks it aside. Whatever it is that got flushed down into the pit that shouldn't be there, it'll just stay around until this eventually nibbles little pieces of it and gets rid of it, or it's going to float around down there until it, but it won't jam up the pump. Nothing can go in there until it gets, hits that blade and gets cut into little pieces. This is something, too, that Ridgeway can do on a branch level. Like Joe said, we have the big trailer that's branded Liberty Pumps. Ridgeway has a little trailer that's not necessarily branded Liberty Pumps yet, but we have the ability to take that to your end users, to your contractors and show it off. I call it the shock and awe piece because it is very cool. And people want to see jeans. They want to see pieces of Carhartt. They want to see anything and everything, little kids toys, because you know yeah. what ends up in there. Yeah. So that really tells the story of what these grinder pumps can do. So I have that ability. That's something I'm a phone call away where we can do that demo and, and show it off. So, yeah. And what I'll cover really quickly, um, you know, as this slide says, similar concept to paths. As I mentioned, we didn't invent the grinder pump, a different style of, it's still called the grinder, but it really, I, I hate calling it that because I think it works differently. It does tear things up to an extent, but does anybody know what that is or anybody run into E1 or environmental one? Okay. Um, if I can say something good about that company, it's one of their strengths is since the 60s, they get spec on new construction all over the place. And I don't know how they get it, right? Whether they buy it, borrow it, steal it, cheat. I don't know, but there, there's so many sets of plans where they're spec. And that's okay. Uh, sometimes we have um, people that look at that and say, I've had a bad experience. I don't want to do that. I'm going to put in a Liberty where it'll fit. You know, but ours just has a slightly different looking basin. It's fiberglass, not that. Uh, it doesn't matter. What I'm saying is if they get new spec, at least for me, I'd say it doesn't matter because uh, eventually I think we're going to wind up replacing it, which is one of the product categories that we sell that you guys move is this, uh, we call it the RE series. And I always think in my mind, RE means replacement. That is when somebody specced in and they've got that E1 pump and they're frustrated because it does keep jamming up tons of service calls. We've made something that makes it pretty easy for a contractor to go out and just basically pull the guts out of that can that's made by E1 and put Liberty guts inside of it. So it still looks like it's their basin. But everything from that panel to the plugs to that gooseneck fitting, the cam locks around that base, basically, again, it makes it super easy for a contractor to go and just rip the guts out of that can and start over. So uh, that's what we call, again, the RE. The only thing, as I mentioned now about E1, I said something, their strength, right? A lot of new construction spec. The weakness is the actual motor. They've been making that same progressive cavity pump and motor since the 60s. And the only thing they've changed is what type of plug they use. And that's the only thing we need to know. It's an older style with a round plug. That way everything, again, I mentioned plug and play. We wanna make it super simple for somebody to go out and do that change now. So if we know it's older with that round style plug or the more modern, you know, elongated rectangular plug, if we know that, we, we have it wired the way you need it. It comes 
ready to go. And if there's, if we can get those specs, our people back in New York, our customer service team, they'll take those specs and do the comparable to, to Liberty. I noticed Kalispell's on here. There's a lot of E1 up there and a lot of E1 on the specs. So we'll do that work for you, for the branches, for the contractors, if that comes up, so. Yeah, and I'm trying to, again, this this is where the uh, the secret sauce is, and it's not just the, the quality and the power in that motor, it's the strength of this blade and the design. The way it works is, you know, here is your, your inlet coming from the bottom, and your impeller is still turning and drawing water and causing that suction from underneath there. As I mentioned before, as you saw that blade, nothing can get inside of that pump until it hits that blade. So as Jason mentioned, kids' little toys, you find the Barbie doll, a Lego minifigure, a Hot Wheel. It gets flushed, and what's going to happen is that blade's going to hit it. It's going to make a lot of noise, and it's, it's fun when we do this, when we do the parking lot demos, because what will happen is it'll make noise for hours, but eventually a little minifigure hand will show up, a wheel from the Hot Wheel car, maybe the windshield or a piece of metal, and you'll start seeing metal flakes show up. It can't get it all at once, but it'll keep knocking around and making noise where if in a real life situation, in a residential pit, it might be a month before that Hot Wheels totally chewed up, but eventually it's going to get to it. When we do our thing, where we do it from red shop rags to denim jeans, my favorite part is when we cut up denim, denim jeans, sometimes there's rivets on the pocket, so there's brass zippers. Eventually you'll start seeing little shiny brass pieces coming out because again, it'll take up little pieces at a time. And then there's times where a big piece of the pocket with a rivet just gets thrown aside. And again, it sits, that's my favorite part of this is it won't jam because reality is when the float drops because the water level drops, if we go back to a progressive cavity pump, right? One of these pumps, what could happen is something can be partially inside and like Murphy's Law, right? It's going to be on a Friday afternoon, a Sunday, not on Monday to Friday. And that float's going to drop and that rag or that uh, flushable wipes, those have been the big issue now. They gather back together they will jam up right inside. So what'll happen is when that float comes back up, that motor can't get enough momentum to get going because something's stuck in its way. And again, if you look at that design, there's no way that can happen because nothing's going to be inside of the pump unless it's pea-sized and cut into a little chunk before it goes in. It, can't, it never bites off more than it can chew. I think, uh, and again, this is one of my favorite, and I know we're getting towards the end, but uh, one of my favorite items that we've had, as I mentioned, the flushable wipes, uh, the sewer pumps, right? This is a one horse, 115 volt. We kind of call it our residential, if you will, but it's a one horsepower grinder. Um, it's got a two inch vertical discharge. If you look at it, just like I mentioned in the beginning about somebody says, I need a grinder pump, and you, you give them one, because often they're taking out a sewage pump. And where we've had a lot of good luck with this is uh, rest stops, state park campgrounds, places where when they opened up back after the pandemic and everybody fell in love with their flushable wipes, their Clorox wipes, they'll go in, and even the masks that they were wearing, the rubber gloves, they get flushed. Um, state parks are my favorite. One of the reasons I talk about this is I've, I've got a simple solution and I'm gonna be quiet about it because uh, to the state parks because they're buying our pumps and I don't wanna ruin that. But what happens is they have these community bathrooms where there's a toilet in six different little private rooms. There's no sink, there's no wastebasket. So when you walk out, you can wash your hands on the ends of the building where there's one community sink and a wastebasket. What do you think happens when you don't put a wastebasket in when there's just a closed door and a toilet? Anything that you want to get rid of is going to go right down. And even though they say don't, well, stuff gets flushed. What's been happening is their two inch vertical dish card sewage pumps that are down in those pits have just been jamming up. And again, the worst culprit it used to just be tampons and paper towels, right? Back in the, now it is masks and it's flushable wipes. Uh, it's been a really easy sell to tell them, look, I know it's three times more than a regular sewage pump, but do you want to keep on jamming it every three weeks or do you want something that has no problems whatsoever? And usually the option is pretty easy to upsell and do a grinder in that situation. Same with vacation homes, uh, Montana, Arizona, a lot of places, Sedona, every Airbnb and every uh, vacation rental I've ever gone into has got labels all over the bathroom. Please do not flush paper towels. Please do not flush feminine hygiene products. But guess what? The renters that come in and stay on vacation, they're not paying attention to that. They flush whatever they want. And we're constantly seeing plumbers go and, and jam tampons and paper towels. And mostly, again, the flushable wipes these days are killing them. sewage pumps. Grinders get right through that, no problem. So think of this as like a miniature version of our Omnivore. We call it the Pro War. And a slightly smaller blade because it's got a slightly smaller motor, but it's the same technology. It's the same idea. But when we do the demos on this one, we, we're a little bit lighter on it. We don't maybe throw the mop heads and the huge pieces of denim and all the, like the other one will chew through. But again, we do the red shop rags and we do other things that you don't think would ever really get flushed, but sometimes do. 
Um, so it just has a much better chance of getting through something than a standard two-inch sewage pump with a regular impeller. It's an insurance policy. There you go. Uh, and then, again, uh, whether it's a sewage pump or a grinder pump, we, another claim to fame for Liberty is how well we do our pump packages. We really kind of, I don't want to say we invented the category, but we are uh, we are pretty damn good at it. We were one of the early pioneers of this. And what do they say about imitations, the highest form of flattery? Just about all of our competitors are trying to do some version of our packages now where there's uh, a basin and there's rails and there's a panel and there's all those things to put together. But we do a great job of making sure, again, plug and play. You dig a hole, you drop it in, it's good to go. So that kind of runs most of the gamut from the small stuff to the big stuff that we do. Are there any other questions on that for me or Jason? We're here for you. Anything? Anybody remember where Liberty Pumps is actually located? Yeah.